Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Have History Will Travel. I'm your host, the Wilder historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder, and last time Sherman marched through South Carolina and entered North Carolina. Now we watch as he brings the war to a close in his front as Ulysses S. Grant chases after Robert E. Lee out of Richmond. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider subscribing if you haven't done so already, join the Patreon page, or purchase something from the Teespring store or Etsy shop. Thank you. In Fayetteville, Sherman ran into a soldier whom he had been friends with in the Antebellum Army. The man happily approached Sherman and struck up a conversation with him. A soldier remembered what happened next. Yes, we were long together, weren't we? Sherman asked. Yes, answered the pleased Southerner. You shared my friendship, shared my bread even, didn't you? Sherman persisted. Indeed, indeed, the increasingly happy man replied. Sherman stared at him harshly. You have betrayed it all. Me, your friend, your country that educated you for its defense. You are here a traitor, and you ask me to be again your friend, to protect your property, to send you these brave men, some of whose comrades were murdered by your neighbor this very morning, fired on from hidden houses by you and yours as they entered the town. Turn your back to me forever. I will not punish you. Only go your way. There is room in this world even for traitors. The shaken southerner walked away crestfallen. Sherman sat down for lunch, but he could barely eat. The corners of his mouth twitched as he continued talking to us of this false friend. The hand that held the bread trembled, and for a moment tears were in his eyes. His subordinates were shocked at the depth of his feeling. We realized, as never before, one later wrote, what treason to the Republic really meant. At Fayetteville, Sherman destroyed everything of military significance and left the city on March 15th. Confederate Colonel Alfred Rhett was captured soon on the march. He was a former commander of Fort Sumter and was an editor for the Charleston Mercury. Sherman had dinner with him and delighted in the fact that he could see Confederate morale collapsing in front of him. When a Union officer was found to be mistreated by Confederate soldiers under Wade Hampton, Sherman ordered Rhett to be removed from his horse and walked to prison. On his way to Goldsboro, Joseph E. Johnston, Sherman's nemesis in the Atlanta campaign, blocked one of his wings. While holding him in place with Henry Slocum's wing, Oliver Otis Howard's wing approached Johnston's other flank. Although Sherman had the opportunity possibly to destroy Johnston at that moment, he didn't. He felt that his style of warfare was working without bringing on senseless casualties. Johnston would retreat, and Sherman would continue to Goldsboro, where he would meet up with reinforcements, particularly the 23rd Corps under John M. Schofield. The railroad from there to New Bern was repaired by March 25th, and now Sherman had good communications and a supply base from which to draw needed equipment for his ragged soldiers. A few days later, he was at City Point, Virginia on the James River to meet with Grant. On the wharf, the two men greeted each other warmly, happy to see each other after such a long separation. Grant, Sherman, and Grant's subordinates sat around a campfire hearing about the stories of the march to the sea and through the Carolinas. Sherman told one story about seeing a soldier and told him that he'd like to swap legs with him. The soldier eyed Sherman up and down and said that if that's what he would get, then he'd rather not make the trade. After an hour of talking, the men went aboard the boat, the River Queen, where President Abraham Lincoln was, alone. Lincoln wanted to hear all about Sherman's adventures through Georgia and the Carolinas, but worried that Sherman had made a mistake by leaving his army. Sherman insisted that John M. Schofield, whom he left in charge, was more than capable of handling the army. After the meeting, Grant and Sherman ran into Julia Dent Grant. She asked about Mrs. Lincoln, who had been aboard the River Queen. Grant told her that he hadn't even given it a thought, and Sherman said he wasn't aware that she was even on the boat. Julia scolded both of them for being so neglectful. Sherman then attempted to change the subject by asking Grant to discuss what to be done next with his army. Julia jokingly asked if they didn't want her to be a part of their secret meeting. Sherman also jokingly asked if they could trust her, to which Grant responded, I'm not so sure about that, Sherman. Sherman and Grant poured over maps, having a great time being back together and planning like they had done for Vicksburg. The next day, Grant, Sherman, and Admiral David Dixon Porter met with Lincoln on the River Queen to discuss what they hoped to be the last days of the war. Lincoln and Sherman talked the most. The president expressed concern that Lee would escape south and join Johnston. Sherman insisted that if that happened, he could hold both Confederate armies in place until Grant arrived to deliver a death blow. Grant argued 
that Johnston or Lee could use the railroads to escape, but Sherman informed them that his men had destroyed so many miles of rail that there were no railroads to carry these armies south. Sherman left the River Queen when all was said and done, then proceeded back to North Carolina. On April 7th, Sherman received word that Lee had left Richmond. He wrote to Grant, It is our interest to let Lee and Johnston come together, just as a billiard player would nurse the balls when he has them in a nice place. He would also write, You have established a reputation for perseverance and pluck that would make Wellington jump out of his coffin. Word got to Sherman that Lee had surrendered on April 9th at Appomattox Courthouse, sending Sherman and his troops into a joyous shout. A North Carolina farmer approached Sherman for horses or mules for him to plant crops this spring, but Sherman refused, saying, I cannot undertake to supply horses or to encourage peaceful industry in North Carolina until the state shall perform some public act showing that, as to her, war is over. In Raleigh, Sherman held a grand review of his army, displaying the military might of the Union. Women in the crowd cried, knowing that the war was now over. In a story about Sherman's time in Raleigh, he met with an inmate from the city's lunatic asylum. The man asked to be released, but Sherman said for the man to have faith in God and in his power to take care of all of us. The inmate responded, Well, I think I do believe in a sort of divine providence, but when it comes to the question of power, it strikes me that for a man who has been walking about over the country whipping these cursed rebels, you have a sight more power than anybody I know of. Sherman met with a peace commission from the governor of North Carolina, Zebulon Vance. The commission admitted that the war was over and the Confederacy lost, but Johnson's army was still operating in North Carolina. The talks ended without anything concrete being settled. On April 14th, Johnson wrote to Sherman that there needed to be a halt to hostilities while civil authorities brought the war to a close. Sherman agreed and wrote to him saying that he would give Johnston and his troops the same terms that Grant gave Lee. Sherman and Johnston agreed to meet on April 17th. That morning, Sherman received a telegram informing him of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Sherman swore the telegrapher and John A. Logan, who was there, to secrecy and placed the awful note in his pocket. Johnston and Sherman, as well as their escorts, met on the Hillsborough Road and asked a local farmer, James Bennett, if they could use his dwelling. The two generals stepped into the home alone, their staff and escorts waiting outside. After a little small talk, Sherman showed Johnston the note. Sweat began to beat up on Johnston's head, and he became worried that blame would fall on the Confederate government and army. Sherman assured him that he didn't blame Johnston or the troops, but he wasn't sure if Jefferson Davis wasn't above having something to do with it. Nevertheless, Sherman told Johnston he feared what his troops might do when they found out, especially if a Southerner said something untoward about the situation. There could be violence. Johnston wanted more time to confer with what was left of the Confederate government and see if he would be able to negotiate for all Confederate armies. Sherman agreed and the meeting ended. They came outside to find Confederate cavalryman Wade Hampton and Union cavalryman Judson Kilpatrick in a fight. The appearance of both men broke up the altercation. When Sherman informed his soldiers of Lincoln's assassination, they wanted retribution, but Sherman wouldn't allow it. When part of John A. Logan's corps marched toward Raleigh, the corps commander threatened them with artillery until they turned back. All night, Sherman rode between the camps, keeping anyone from marching on Raleigh to exact retribution. The next day, Johnston and Sherman met again, this time with Confederate Secretary of War John C. Breckinridge included. Johnston and Breckinridge put forward a general agreement Sherman wanted to draft his own terms that would bring the war to a close. In his agreement, amnesty was given to the Confederate soldiers as long as they returned home and placed their arms in arsenals and obeyed the laws, then their political rights would be restored. This would bring the entire war to a close, surrendering all Confederate soldiers everywhere. They also would be able to keep their property. The meeting ended, and Sherman sent the agreement to Washington, D.C., where Grant, Henry Halleck, and President Andrew Johnson would read over the terms. In letters to Grant and Halleck, Sherman asked them not to alter the agreement because any other details could be worked out later. He also insisted that Johnston and Breckinridge agreed that slavery was dead, so there was no need to put it in the agreement. He hoped this agreement would prevent Confederate armies from breaking up into guerrilla bands. Sherman was incredibly proud of his actions and the agreement that he saw as ending the war completely. That was why he was incredibly surprised and depressed when Grant wrote back that the terms had been turned down by Johnson in the cabinet. Grant wrote to him saying that the agreement went beyond his military authority. The political and civil aspects of this agreement 
were not within his power to make. That was up to the President and Congress. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton bashed Sherman and his actions, accusing him of letting Jefferson Davis get away with hard money by entertaining this farcical terms of surrender. The nation was outraged at the leniency Sherman had on the Confederates, whom he himself had waged a harsh war against. Grant arrived in North Carolina stating that hostilities should commence unless Johnston wants to surrender. Grant was expected to take over Sherman's army, but out of respect to his friend, he stayed on the sidelines. Sherman informed Johnston of the rejected terms and the return to hostilities. Johnston didn't want the war to continue and met with Sherman on April 26th and agreed to the terms laid out when Lee surrendered to Grant. It would be the largest surrender of Confederate forces of the war, over 80,000 soldiers from North Carolina down to Florida in Johnston's realm of authority. Despite the great success for Sherman, his original agreement that had been dismissed and bashed by Stanton placed him in an unfavorable light with many Northerners who viewed him as too lenient to the South.